Good morning, everyone, uh, and welcome to the NYU uh, Returns webinar for adjunct faculty. Uh, just some housekeeping items. Uh, note that this uh, webinar is being recorded and should be on the NYU Returns uh, site uh, shortly, uh, and that there is closed captioning for this webinar uh, as well. Uh, I'm Carlos Ciotoli, Associate Vice President for Student Health here at NYU and Executive Lead for the University's COVID Prevention and Response Team. Uh, with me are Gigi DePico, Vice Provost for Undergraduate Academic Affairs and for the Humanities, uh, Vice Provost Kristen Day, uh, and Clay Shirky, Vice Provost for Educational Technologies. Thank you again for joining uh, and we'll get started. Um, you'll hear from uh, myself, uh, from Gigi, and from Clay, some brief presentations, uh, and then we'll get to some of the questions uh, both that you submitted uh, and that you can submit uh, through the Q&A uh, in Zoom. Um, so I wanted to start really with some background to make sure that we are all on the same page uh, factually about uh, where things are, uh, and then uh, with that background, go into some of the planning uh, for the fall. Uh, the first thing I wanted to make mention of is the Delta variant, uh, which has obviously uh, been in the news, um, and just share for people uh, what I think presumably most people know, that it is in fact significantly more transmissible than the prior uh, COVID-19 viruses. Um, and you know we've seen that play out uh, in certain parts of the country in particular. Uh, <clears throat> but on the plus side, we've also seen that the vaccines have held up fairly well to the Delta variant uh, and still so show significant uh, efficacy against the variant. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about breakthrough infections um, in a minute, uh, but the vaccines are still uh, significantly effective against the Delta variant, particularly against severe disease, people requiring hospitalizations um, and preventing death. So those are important points to uh, remember. With that said, COVID is still largely now a, a disease of the unvaccinated. And if you look at a map of where COVID is spreading, where case counts are high, um, it correlates very strongly for parts of the countries, uh, parts of the country that have lower vaccination rates. With that said, we know that breakthrough infections happen. Even when the first reports came out uh, of the clinical trials for the vaccines, uh, people were thrilled that the efficacy of the vaccine was in the 90s. It was well beyond, I think, what most people had expected, but it did mean that certain people uh, who were vaccinated were getting infection. So it shouldn't come as a shock uh, that we are having some degree of breakthrough infection. Um, and again, we'll talk a little bit more about those in a minute. Um, I wanna focus on one study uh, that came out just a couple of weeks ago that I think put some of these breakthrough infections in the news. Um, and uh, some of it tied to, you know, are the vaccines becoming less effective? Uh, and it was the CDC, a big, uh, I believe a week ago Wednesday, um, puts out what they call MMWR, Morbidity Mortality Weekly Report, um, and there were three studies in that. Uh, one was uh, actually showing that the vaccines were still highly effective in preventing severe disease, one was among nursing home uh, and residents of long-term care facilities, which they did see some decline in vaccine effectiveness. But I think the one that's most important for us to focus on uh, is the one where they pulled data, it was a New York State data set where they pulled basically millions of records of people who were vaccinated and unvaccinated in New York State and looked to see who was getting sick after that. And what they did show was that there was overall a slight decrement in the uh, effectiveness of the vaccine by about 12%. But if you looked deeper into the data, and that was certainly the, the headline in the news, um, but one thing I will share is that um, it's certainly, I feel my responsibility to go beyond the headlines, read the story, and then go to the primary source of the information, which in this case, again, was the CDC report, that although the effectiveness of the vaccine went down by about 12%, uh, from the early part of the year uh, until summer, when the Delta variant became uh, more predominant, they did an age breakdown. And what was fascinating in the age breakdown was in the older population, those greater than 65 years of age, the vaccine effectiveness went from 92% to 89%, only a 3% decrease in vaccine effectiveness. 
Now, if it was truly the vaccine that was losing its effectiveness, and that was the only reason for this overall decline, one would have expected from a biologic, physiologic point of view that the older people would have had um, greater risk uh, over time, but we didn't see that. So I think it does support the notion that it's not the vaccine alone uh, that's the issue. Certainly the emergence of the Delta variant uh, is part of it. And this is consistent, the third point, um, consistent I think across a couple of studies, people began to relax um, their mask wearing, they engaged in more social activities, often maskless. Um, so it's an important point to raise that while vaccines certainly have retained a high degree of effectiveness, it appears even more so as long as we maintain some of those other mitigation strategies. Um, the other thing I will point out is that some of the headlines that were raised about one, breakthrough infections, but also vaccinated people able to spread COVID um, came from a study uh, of an outbreak in Provincetown, Massachusetts. And for those of you, again, who knew what was going on in Provincetown, I heard from someone who was in Provincetown, there was a major festival going on at the time. There was a lot of highly interactive, unmasked activity, uh, the type of which should not be happening in most of our formal settings, certainly not in our classroom settings. So again, I think if we're thoughtful about where the risk was coming from, it's not really in the type of activities that we would see in formal NYU activities in or out of the classroom. Um, so a little bit of that. Um, again, I think just the other thing, just in terms of benchmarking, you know, we're seeing all of higher ed for the most part opening. Nationally, K through 12 is opening, um, including you know, below the age of 12 where they can't be vaccinated. And public health officials have all signed off uh, on reopening the public schools with masks. So again, feeling that that creates a safe environment. Um, the other thing I just wanna mention before walking through sort of our plan is how we actually get to our plan. What's the decision-making process? Uh, and obviously a lot of guidance, formal guidance goes into this from the CDC, the New York City Department of Health, the New York State Department of Health, um, the medical center, I consult routinely with NYU Langone and their hospital epidemiologists, uh, our professional association or my professional association, the American College Health Association establishes guidelines, has opportunities for sharing best practices across institutions, um, certainly consulting with academics in public health, um, including our own school of public health, uh, reviewing the broad literature that comes out around COVID, um, clinically and from a public health perspective. Um, one area that I think we have tremendous advantage is leveraging our experience from last year. Uh, we probably had more students, certainly from as a private university, more students back on campus than almost any other private universities. Some of our peer institutions, which I know many people point to as well, they're doing this, they're doing that, really were very limited in their opening and have limited experience about what worked and what didn't. And we were highly successful last year. I think as you've seen, we really had almost no evidence uh, of transmission of COVID in the classroom and in any other formal settings. Um, and I think we learned quite a bit uh, in our experience last year uh, that we can leverage in our planning for this year. Um, I might also add that um, from a purely personal point of view, uh, I am cer certainly empathetic to people who have either younger children at home, um, perhaps at-risk uh, family members. I have an 11-year-old uh, who's going back. Uh, so from a personal perspective, I got vested interest um, in reviewing the literature, making sure that uh, we're doing all the right things. Um, so that's a bit, I think, about how we um, plan this out and what goes into the decision-making. So one of the things I just wanna really emphasize is that we spent the bulk of this end of spring uh, and summer focusing on getting people vaccinated. It is core to our entire strategy uh, of opening safely. Uh, and I think every public health official um, would go on record as saying it is probably first um, and foremost the most important piece of the strategy, but not the only piece. And I think perhaps we set expectations, um, you know, probably falsely that, well, if we all got vaccinated, everything would go back to normal. And there appeared to be a brief period of time where I think we could have convinced ourselves of that.
But certainly in our planning, we never got away from the fact that we would need multiple layers of safety. Uh, we never relaxed our masking restriction. We kept restrictions on uh, campus visitors and we'll walk through it. Um, so while we've been heavily focused on getting high vaccination rates, we always knew it would not be the only component of our strategy to open safely. We have very high rates of vaccination. Uh, I think we are all quite pleased with where we are. Uh, on the employee side, we're in the mid 90s. Uh, most of our larger um, employee groups uh, are um, inching towards the upper 90s. Um, as a group, the adjuncts, I think, um, are probably hovering just under 90%. Uh, but I think part of that is um, just ensuring that we're getting accurate information about who's teaching in the fall. Um, and my thanks to everyone who has uploaded, because clearly the vast majority of you have. Uh, so my thanks. Uh, but we start off, again, in a very good place. On the student side, um, <clears throat> we're approaching 90%. But there's a big disparity between our US-based students who are at about 95 and our international students who are just a hair below 80, uh, in part because they're coming from parts of the world where vaccine is simply not available or they don't have access to an FDA or WHO listed vaccine. We have set up BOPE's library as a vaccination site. Uh, it has been open for a week now. Um, it will continue to be open uh, throughout uh, the semester to ensure that anyone who needs a vaccine upon arrival will get it. Uh, and we anticipate all of our international students, we frankly anticipate all of our students getting vaccinated um, uh, within short order uh, of arrival. So again, we will start off with exceptionally high rates of vaccination. On the issue of boosters, which I know people have asked about, um, and that's sort of an evolving situation. I think Johnson & Johnson just put out today that they uh, now have shown evidence that their uh, booster of J&J &J also increases antibody levels. Uh, we're sort of tracking that closely. If it appears that boosters are necessary, um, I think we will do whatever we can do to facilitate people getting boosters. Uh, we'll make some policy decisions around whether we will require it. Um, but again, very aware of that issue. So that's the vaccination side of things. Um, as I said before, masking is critical. Uh, it is a cornerstone really of the K through 12 approach. We never relaxed our masking requirement. So uh, our requirement for the at least fall semester, or at least to start the fall semester will be that everyone vaccinated or not be masked indoors at any of our facilities uh, or to attend an NYU event. Uh, that includes faculty, uh, which is really for both the protection of all the students, but your protection as well. Uh, so again, and in fact, there was a question raised about microphones and certainly I think um, there's low risk of transmission through microphones, but certainly masking, I think also uh, minimizes that risk even further. Um, testing, I do wanna take a minute or two just to talk about our testing strategy. I think we will have a fairly comprehensive testing strategy anyone who is unvaccinated, so those who have exemptions, those who are only partially vaccinated, but not fully vaccinated, will be required to test through one of our two sites, either our bioreference site uh, or through our Binks distribution um, kits. Uh, so um, everyone will test weekly and access to the daily screener will be dependent on that. So theoretically, a student cannot get access or anyone in the NY community can't get access to buildings and have a green screen unless they're either fully vaccinated or they have evidence of uh, weekly testing. We'll have a second group of testing that we're calling indicated testing. So that would be people who are symptomatic. We're encouraging everyone who has symptoms to test, uh, anyone who is deemed a close contact to test. Um, and those people should be filling out the self-reporting form to let us know uh, and should be getting tested. And then we've got a large third arm of testing, which we're calling discretionary testing, which would be, although it might not meet a formal indication for testing, um, it would allow people who found themselves perhaps in a higher risk situation, whether that's international travel, whether they were at an event uh, that was more crowded than they thought, people weren't wearing masks, uh, and where they self-assessed that they felt it was a higher risk uh, exposure, uh, and they want to get themselves testing tested, and people can avail themselves uh, of that testing uh, at any point. 
Um, I want to make a point about why not just test everybody every week. Um, and we're probably inching towards a population of 70 to 80,000 on campus between students and employees. Uh, and I want to make the point that um, when you do testing, you want to think through how the testing might come out. Uh, and if uh, when we looked at the effectiveness of PCR testing, there's one piece of it in terms of how it performs that's called specificity. How good is it at ruling out someone who doesn't have disease? So how often is someone who uh, is disease free showing up with a negative test? And the College of American Pathologists puts that number at about 98 to 99% of the time. And if we sort of ex give that test the benefit of the doubt and say, let's say it's even 99.5% specific for that group, that means five out of a thousand people will falsely test positive. And a population of 70 to 80,000, you're talking 350 to 400 people who might falsely test positive, which, on one hand is disruptive to them uh, in terms of having to miss class, miss work, uh, academic disruption. It also is disruptive to our efforts to ensure the safety of the campus. It's 350 people that we then have to reach out to who posed no risk at all, slowing down getting to the smaller number of people who actually might be true positives and assessing all the contacts. So again, we're trying to be thoughtful about um, identifying those people who might be uh, at higher risk for any reason and getting them tested. Uh, so again, we think that's a thoughtful approach uh, and one that we'll continue to look at and modify uh, as we move forward. Uh, we are gonna continue to, although we're not having universal distancing in the classroom, uh, again, with masking and vaccination, we feel we did not need to do that. Uh, but for uh, certain situations, we will ask that uh, people distance. So the unvaccinated individuals, those who have exemptions, uh, if they are attending a larger gathering or event, um, we would ask them to distance. Uh, when people are eating, vaccinated or not, we're asking people to distance as well. Um, and even where possible in the classroom, we've tried to create, and we know this is not universal, but certainly in some of the larger lecture spa uh, halls and lecture spaces um, of having space up front in the front of the classroom, um, generally from the front of the wall to the first row, um, roughly seven to 10 feet. Um, it should allow for six, foot, uh, six feet of social distancing there. Um, and smaller seminar rooms, uh, certainly uh, if the rooms can be arranged in a way to maximize distancing between um, the uh, instructor and the rest of the class. Uh, reminding ourselves that again, in K through 12, they're using three feet of distancing. Uh, Abu Dhabi and Shanghai for the entire year last year used uh, a meter, roughly three feet of distancing. And this is when we were unvaccinated. And again, did not real, see uh, a real issue with that. Uh, so again, uh, distancing where appropriate, uh, distancing where we can. Uh, we're also looking to reduce density on campus. Uh, that's being somewhat restrictive about who can come onto campus, uh, visitors, vendors, affiliates, uh, really allowing those uh, who are core to the academic uh, and research mis mission. They will also have to show proof of vaccination. Uh, if they have an exemption, they will have to test. Um, we have uh, guidelines around meetings, gatherings, and events, which again, creates some risk mitigation there about trying to be somewhat restrictive about those. Uh, and we will continue on with our case management. That is identifying positive cases. We'll continue with our COVID, our own university COVID prevention and response team to get people who test positive um, as isolated as quickly as possible. Identify people who are at higher risk, uh, perhaps by being uh, close contacts uh, and following public health protocols there. Um, Two points on that, just because I know people have asked. Um, so there will be no broad classroom notification. We will do what we did last year, which is what worked, uh, which is that we reach out to the infected individual, the one who's positive, uh, do the uh, intake and evaluation uh, of who might be a close contact, and then reach out to them uh, and um, have the appropriate intervention. 
CDC guidance right now is that if you're fully vaccinated, a close contact does not need to quarantine, but they would be asked to test three to five days after the last exposure. I would also say that um, no one is allowed to ask an individual um, if they've tested positive, why they might be out. Uh, you cannot ask specific medical information uh, of a student uh, or another faculty member. Now, they may disclose to you, and if they do, that's fine. They've self-disclosed. You would probably just want to ensure that they have uh, filled out the self-report form. Uh, we will find out about any testing done through uh, our testing sites, uh, but again, um, if it's uh, reassuring, you can encourage them to uh, self-report. Um, and then finally, uh, as it relates to ventilation, because I know that's been a concern, uh, and um, I know that the VP for Facilities and Construction Management has been working with her team uh, across campus. Uh, they are maximizing the, introdu maximizing the introduction of outdoor air uh, by opening the outdoor air dampers. Uh, they are increasing the minimal settings on the HVAC system, so they draw in at least 25% of circulated air from the outdoors. Uh, they have done an analysis of all the systems to ensure that they're operating properly, that all the filters uh, are uh, appropriately sized and up to date, uh, and uh, improving the central air filtration without reducing the uh, design airflow. So again, they've been sort of on that um, and then lastly, just on the sort of personal hygiene front, um, we'll certainly encourage hand washing. Um, although I think it's uh, become more apparent over the last year that uh, transmission through uh, contact uh, is probably significantly less of a mode of transmission than through aerosol through the air. Um, but uh, again, uh, we'll uh, ensure that people are uh, hand washing as much as possible. Um, we also will encourage students uh, to stay home when sick. Uh, and again, people should not be asking why. Uh, we're encouraging some degree of uh, academic flexibility uh, because we can't provide notes for everyone uh, who is sick and staying home. Uh, so I think um, faculty should be thoughtful about academic policies that allows for some degree of unexcused absences. Um, and then just to address sort of one uh, other component about asking for health-related information. Uh, the other thing that people cannot do is ask for people's uh, vaccination status. So if someone is compliant and they have a green screen, um, that is what allows them to get into class, uh, but we cannot be asking individuals uh, about their vaccination status either. So I will stop and I think Gigi, you're up next. Thank you so much, Carlo, and thank you for, for everything you've done to keep us safe. Um, I want to just start by saying on behalf of, of President Hamilton and Provost Fleming, um, thank you for all the heroic work that all of you uh, have, have been doing throughout the last year and, and saying how important uh, and integral a part of the university our adjunct faculty are, and we're, we're really grateful for, for all your contributions. Thank you for being here today. Um, as you've just heard from Carlo, health and safety remain our top priority. Academic excellence is second only to that, um, but that does remain our top priority. And you've just heard about the multi-layered approach to safety that NYU is, is taking uh, in order to, to keep all our faculty, our, our students, our staff, our administrators, the whole community um, healthy and, and safe. I wanna just stress before I, I start answering some of the, the questions that, that have come in, uh, how important in-person teaching is to our students in a pulse survey that was conducted at the very end of last year, asking students what reason, um, what are the reasons that they would uh, want to come back to NYU, the number one reason ahead of seeing their friends, ahead of uh, exploring New York City, the number one reason was to be able to take in-person classes. So, so just to, to stress how, how really important that is to our students and how we are looking forward to having everybody back in the classrooms in a way that's, um, that, that is safe and, uh, and that also accomplishes our, our academic uh, goals and priorities. 
Um, I guess the, the first question I want to address that's come in is that of non-compliant students. As you've heard from Carlo, our student compliance numbers are excellent already. Those numbers continue to go up every day as more and more vaccine proofs are being uploaded by, by students. Um, our, our expectation in terms of non-compliant students in your classroom is that that number will be exactly equal to zero uh, because those students will not be able to be in your classrooms. Uh, they will not have access to uh, being in person on campus uh, in any NYU building, classroom, residence halls, dining halls, libraries, gyms, uh, et cetera. Uh, so, so there will not be any non-compliant students in your, in your classes. Uh, if, if students, we've, we've also, I should say, enjoined and, and the academic advisors to reach out to students who are non-compliant the, the good news is that so far, the answer that they have heard most widely is, I had no idea I was past the deadline, let me upload uh, right away. So we do have some students who are being typical 20 year olds um, in terms of not uploading perhaps uh, in time, but the good news is that, that we are not seeing students saying, I'm not planning on, on getting vaccinated. Uh, so, so that's, uh, I guess the, the main question, you know, if, if a student were to remain non-compliant and refuse to be vaccinated, uh, they would need to, uh, they would need to de-enroll from any in-person classes if their specific program has online classes that they're able to take in order to continue making academic progress, we would advise the student to do that. But if, if the program does not have online classes for them, then that student would need to de-enroll from, from the university. And even the students who are partially compliant or who receive their first vaccines upon arrival uh, on campus, um, those students will be compliant um, upon being in, in your classes. Um, we've, we've received some questions also about the about in-person classes and how we are thinking about modalities. We know that last year, many of you ran classes that ended up being, um, that started out being in-person, but because of the number of students attending remotely became a kind of hybrid class where you had a, some group of students in the classroom and some group of students um, from home. We have been messaging to students that in-person classes means that they are here in person to take those classes, that if they can't be in person in your classes, that they should look for online classes. Uh, there will certainly be some exceptions to this. Uh, we know that, uh, that the Moses Center has received some requests from students for remote attendance in those classes. That will always uh, involve schools and faculty to work out individualized plans for those students, but will not require every faculty member to potentially make every class a hybrid class. Um, and, and of course, the in-person expectation also extends to, to our faculty. If, you're, if your class is scheduled as an in-person class, the expectation is that you will meet that class in person. Um, short term absences. Uh, we've had a, a we've had some questions just about how to deal with students that that may be absent because they are symptomatic. Uh, we are counseling as, as Carlo uh, uh, just said. Um, we are counseling students who can't, uh, who have any kind of symptoms that are COVID-like, uh, scratchy throat, uh, headache, uh, et cetera, to stay home. Now, we don't want to risk that if they are, uh, even if they're vaccinated, since all the students in, in your class will be compliant, um, that even if they're vaccinated, that if they are uh, positive, we don't want to risk them spreading uh, COVID in, in classrooms, so students will be asked to stay home. We are not requiring that you turn on the Zoom cameras for those students. We are asking that, as you would in any semester for a student that needs to miss some period of class of, of the semester for 
a medical issue or a family emergency that you work with those students. And the provost's office has worked with, with schools, particularly with Steinhardt, on a, a set of strategies uh, for accommodating temporarily remote students. If we can please put that in the, in the chat for everyone. Um, this is a document that certainly lists turning on Zoom as, as one way that you can uh, help these students, but not the only way. Uh, so it includes things from, you know, assigning a note taker to creating office hours virtually for, uh, for students that may be out for some uh, period of time from, from your classes. Uh, Carlo touched also on, on the question of, of, of notes, of medical notes. Uh, we are just asking that you please be flexible. We are not uh, recommending that students get medical notes uh, for, you know, suspected for, for these cases of, of scratchy throats or, or headaches. So we are asking that if you have, if your class has an attendance policy, that you please be flexible with students for this semester, given that the best advice that we are giving them is that if they are in any way symptomatic to go get tested, and to stay home in the meantime. Uh, in terms of faculty who feel any kind of possible COVID symptoms, you should also stay home. Uh, if you are feeling well enough and you're you know, relatively asymptomatic and you want to meet your class on, online or offer them some asynchronous work that they can do, you are absolutely welcome to do so. If not, do what you would do in any other semester. If you were feeling unwell, reach out to your, to your department chair, to your colleagues, to ask whether someone might substitute that class for you, or uh, if you are gonna suspend or postpone that class meeting. Um, in terms of student uh, accommodations, we don't want to burden faculty with needing to decide the student does or does not qualify for an accommodation. Simply, if a student writes to you and says, I have some kind of medical issue or disability, I'd really like to take your class, can I please take it remotely? Please just refer them to the Moses Center. They are well equipped to handle those, those questions and to work closely with students and, and with your, your schools and, and even with you um, to, to figure out what the best solutions are. Um, I, I think I will stop there. I know that there have been uh, questions that have been uh, coming in uh, and we can uh, get, to, get to those later, but let me hand off to my colleague, Clay Shirky. Thank you, Gigi. Um, and you, let me reiterate uh, that the, the return to in-person is really uh, essential. Uh, the students are really committed to it, excited by it. We are grateful. Um, I will say a little bit about uh, classroom technology and setup uh, before, the, uh, before the semester begins. Uh, first of all, for those of you who taught in the classroom uh, in the spring, nothing has changed. Uh, the setup is as it was. We have not we have not altered or decommissioned anything. Um, for those of you who may be returning to a classroom uh, for the first time in uh, a while, the one thing that might be different is some classrooms have been outfitted with what are called Zoom carts, uh, which are actually confusingly not carts, but just Zoom installations. They are there to enable uh, remote, uh, remote uh, attendance by students when necessary. As Gigi said, that is not a requirement. It is an option. Uh, if there are cases where you have to temporarily support remote students. And I pasted the, uh, the guide to temporarily supporting remote students uh, into the chat. For those of you in a classroom uh, with that setup, with the Zoom cart setup, um, you will need a laptop to project on the screen or to play anything back over the speakers. Um, faculty have typically brought laptops or devices that they have because that's where they prepared the material. Um, we are also uh, working on uh, supplying laptops into the classrooms. Um, for people who are in a classroom that is not uh, does not have a Zoom card in it, typically classrooms run by your schools, you would just use the podium. Uh, you would just use the podium as usual. Uh, Again, the, the way to figure this out is to get uh, your classroom, uh, get the, the identifier of your classroom from Albert, 
uh, and then go to the classroom list, go to the general classroom list. If your classroom is listed there, it's centrally managed by the university and there is a Zoom cart in that room. If not, you can talk to, uh, to your instructional, uh, the instructional technologist in your school and I will paste, uh, just by way of a reminder, I'll paste the, uh, the document which lists uh, every school with their instructional technologist. So you can always find the person you would ask if you have any questions about classroom setup on the, on the URL I just added. The one other thing I will say, I think many of you have gotten notes about Brightspace. Uh, many of you have already converted classes to Brightspace, the new learning management system that, that NYU is moving to. I would encourage you uh, to set up Brightspace this week as soon as you can. Uh, it is a much easier system to use, frankly, than Sakai, the tool that ran NYU classes. Um, also, Sakai is uh, in the process of being dismantled. NYU is in the middle of a a five-year move to the cloud, as people call it. And the, the Sakai is essentially a, just a brittler system. So we should all be on Brightspace because it, it works better and it's easier to use. But I would encourage you to do it this week uh, because the questions that are come, going to come in from the first week of everybody being back on campus are likely to make it harder to get through to a helpline uh, just because there is going to be a certain amount of adaptation. So if you have questions about Brightspace, I would do that now. Um, and again, you can reach out to your uh, your school instructional tech support. There's also very good uh, instructional materials online. We've converted about 10,000 classes to Brightspace already, so we have a good sense of, of, uh, of how it works. Uh, but getting that out of the way will mean that if you do have questions about classroom tech next week, you won't be in the queue with Brightspace, uh, Brightspace questions at the same time. And, uh, and I'll turn it over to you, Chris. Thanks, I don't have a formal presentation to share, but I will respond to a question that we received in advance. Um, and this is gonna take us into a different topic, which is related to whether or not NYU has any resources that we can provide for adjunct faculty who need additional support for childcare. Um, and I'm happy to share that we do have two such resources that are available to our adjunct faculty. The first of these is a child care Google group. So our work life office um, has established an NYU child care Google group, which is a dedicated space that is only available for NYU families and students. Um, where folks can connect around caregiving needs. And so this kind of functions like a bulletin board where community members can post and respond to queries about caregiving um, jobs or services. We've also just joined a new app called Come, which is a cooperative childcare app where NYU families can rotate ch uh, childcare. So this allows parents to identify and vet other parents and families who have similar caregiving styles and COVID practices in case families wanna share childcare. So you can create a group in this way. Um, you can use the app to kind of meet other families that may be a resource to you. And there is going to be a meet and greet for families who are interested in maybe meeting each other to use Come, and we will share the resource for that in, um, in our chat. That's all for me. And maybe now we want to go back to Carlo to uh, answer some of the questions that we've received. Sure, I have about four, I think, that uh, I've seen come through. Uh, one was about crowded elevators. Um, again, I think given that the majority of people will be vaccinated, masked, and let's hope not on an elevator uh, for more than a couple of minutes uh, would not represent a significant exposure. Um, again, the definition of close contact uh, being at least 10 to 15 minutes. Uh, so hopefully we are not in an elevator for more than 10 or 15 minutes. So that would generally be uh, a low risk uh, interaction. Uh, on the issue of other schools who have had a sort of bump in case counts early in the semester, um, just a couple of comments uh, on that. Uh, that I'll expand a little bit into a, a broader comment. Um, one is that um, we saw this last year uh, where our trends in our test positivity uh, lagged the city. So when the city's case counts and test positivity went up, ours lagged, uh, but went up sort of in parallel, but after a couple of weeks. Uh, and given what we saw about sort of a lack of transmission within the classroom uh, and within sort of the formal NYU settings, uh, you know, it became clear that the external environment was probably driving more of our positivity than anything else. So when we're comparing ourselves, and I think someone put in the example of 
uh, a school in North Carolina. You know, the external environment here, New York City's vaccination rates uh, are quite high. Um, if you look even at a zip code analysis by neighborhoods in New York City, Greenwich Village uh, has one of the highest vaccination rates. So I think that we are in sort of a good position um, as it relates to that. Uh, and one of the reasons I think we can have a little bit more confidence about heading into the semester uh, safer than I think some of these other schools. So, you know, how do we distinguish ourselves? I think the broader community is more highly vaccinated. I don't know what the school's policies are on a host of other things uh, in terms of masking, uh, in terms of testing, uh, in terms of, you know, restricting visitors to campus. Uh, but I think for all those reasons, um, I think we do distinguish ourselves a bit from some of the other schools who have um, had outbreaks or have started the semester perhaps with more cases than they thought. Um, and then just to highlight the case of Rice University, uh, where they actually went remote because of a, an early spike in cases, it turned out that the majority of those were false positives. Uh, again, just sort of being thoughtful about um, our own testing protocols uh, and how we think about it to ensure that we're really testing an appropriate number of people, but those at risk uh, and incorporating that into some of the decision making. Um, again, the broader point also that we look at so many different factors uh, and we will always be flexible about modifying policy, changing policy um, based on various conditions. And that might include our own case counts, city case counts, uh, evidence of one way or another that uh, the vaccine is less effective um, or what have you. Uh, so we keep close tabs on that uh, and modify our policies uh, accordingly. Um, I will reiterate, because I think it was came up in the Q&A, um, that we do not do broad classroom notifications for a positive case. We talk to the individual, uh, we solicit uh, information about what their various exposures were, uh, and then we'll reach out to those who uh, have had uh, what would be considered uh, close contact or a significant high-risk exposure. Uh, if people are vaccinated, again, the uh, action would be to get tested. Uh, if people are unvaccinated, is quarantine plus testing. Uh, and then lastly, we do have on our website, and I'm pretty sure it's up to date, uh, about masking, uh, how to mask appropriately, which masks to use, uh, that's on the return site, and we can probably share out the link, uh, but I'm pretty sure that was recently updated uh, and reviewed as well, so that is on the returns website. I think In terms those of the classrooms and, and masking, we've had a couple of questions about what if a student refuses to wear a mask in class. Uh, you as an instructor should instruct them to don their masks. Uh, if they refuse to do so, uh, you are welcome to ask them to leave your classroom. You do not need to have them in your classroom. If you have repeated instances of a student who consistently is refusing uh, to mask and that you constantly have to be um, asking them to, to mask, there is the COVID compliance uh, email uh, that you may submit their name to and that will go to student conduct. Uh, there's also a couple of questions about whether instructors need to wear masks, even if they are uh, distanced from their students, that um, instructional distance that, that Carlo talked about. Yes, uh, instructors are expected to be masked at all times. And um, uh, there was also a question about whether instructors might be able to modify masking uh, protocols in their own classrooms. Uh, no, we are asking all instructors to follow the university mandate. And as, as a rule, the university mandates have been as strict or stricter than, than national and, and state guidelines. Um, and up, up thread, Bill Rosenblatt asked about um, also about uh, uh, privacy questions around uh, dealing with remote students. And I would say that because there can also be students who are remote because of travel difficulties and visa difficulties, as long as the question is asked about presence in the classroom and not about reason why, we don't, we don't need to support remote students differently for different reasons 
Uh, there are lots of ways in which things might get disrupted for an individual student. So just ask the question about a fact of the classroom without uh, tying it to any medical uh, questioning. And then you will know sort of who you have to deal with without crossing that line into uh, dealing with the students, uh, students' health information. There's a question about if a classroom is too small for the number of students enrolled, um, the registrar should catch that, but you can, of course, uh, reach out to, to your school, to your chair uh, for, uh, for guidance on, on that. At, at other questions. Uh, there's a question, uh, maybe we can put it in the chat about um, uh, how to access the recording uh, for, the, for the webinar. Uh, Monique, maybe if we could throw that link into, into the chat, that would be helpful. Um, Clay, did you touch on the um, ID card expiration dates? I did not. So, so some of you uh, may uh, be unable to enter uh, NYU buildings uh, because, and, and even though you are compliant with the mask with the mask with the vaccine mandate um, that may be just please check your NYU ID so it may be just a question of your NYU ID having having expired there's been a number of cases uh, where that has happened and the compliance was totally fine but it was just an expired ID And I guess I'll just add to that because this is sort of part of the general theme of getting ready for possible new classroom tech, getting ready for Brightspace, checking ID cards. Uh, the semester is going to be as, as ordinary as we can make it, but that is not to say that it is going to be like fall of 2019 to the degree that you can check on anything you will need this week as opposed to next week, you will be better off because it's simply there's more time to adjust, there's more time to react, there's more time to talk to talk to the registrar, et cetera, et cetera. And then I just wanna come back to a question, I think about cleaning of the classroom. So uh, we will continue to follow the CDC guidance on that. Um, it's generally uh, ensuring sort of a full cleaning uh, at least daily. Um, again, going back to uh, what I discussed earlier, the notion of sort of contact transmission uh, appears to be significantly less of an issue. Um, and by encouraging hand washing, uh, I think we also uh, minimize uh, some of the contact, uh, what little there is, uh, minimize that uh, as well. Carla, there's, there's another question just about um, uh, students being contact, uh, students, faculty being contacted uh, if a student tests positive, and I, I think you said it a, a couple of times that it is not automatic, but of course, if the conditions are such that anyone is at any, at any risk, then the PCR team uh, will, will reach out and, and that team will consider all the variables, including length of exposure, including ventilation. Uh, so it, it is not automatic, but if, if anyone is at risk, that team will be um, reaching out. Yeah, and again, it doesn't preclude someone also, if you find out that you have a positive case in your class, for whatever reason, students do disclose, you can fill out the self-report form and let us know. Um, you know, this is intended to be a partnership. Uh, so if you've got concerns, you think someone, you know, was positive, and again, you're being respectful, you're not asking, then send us a self-report form that you're concerned that you might have been exposed. Um, you know, we're also telling, you know, any member of the community, if you feel you've been in a high risk situation, so there are some, you know, I think there was a question in the chat about, you know, perhaps a smaller, less well ventilated room. Um, you know, we're not saying to people, you know, you can't test. Uh, so if people want to test more routinely, we do have this discretionary testing arm that people can go get themselves tested. 
uh, really at whatever frequency, you know, up to once a week. Testing is available in the community fairly routinely. Uh, so again, we are not precluding people from uh, getting tested as well. A brief note on uh, international students. There was a question about that and Clay alluded as well to students who due to visa or travel restrictions may not be able to, to get here. Uh, we have communicated or your, your school advisors have uh, communicated with international students asking them, you know, they have been offered go local depending on, on where they are. The our largest proportion of international students are from China. Go local Shanghai will be running again this fall. Uh, there will be uh, online courses offered from uh, Shanghai that they may take. There are online courses um, offered from New York that they may take. And uh, there are also blended courses being offered from the global sites that students may take uh, to the extent that this works in, in their programs. Um, our expectation, what, what we've been hearing from the Office of Global Services is that students are finding ways of, of getting here for the most part. So we are, we are hopeful that students will largely be able to uh, end up where, where they are intending to be. Uh, and then we will of course work, work with those who, who might not be able to get here. But the, the advice they're rece receiving from school advisors is that they should look uh, for online classes. And if I could just chime in uh, about the rationale for not um, allowing faculty or schools that become aware of a case to notify the rest of the school or their class or anyone else. Uh, there are fairly strict privacy laws about disclosure of any health related information. Uh, so we are being thoughtful about uh, when, where, and how we do disclose that information. So again, if there's concern in the classroom, uh, I would encourage a faculty member to uh, send us uh, a self-report uh, about a case uh, to ensure that appropriate action uh, whatever that might be, is taken. Um, just in terms of other classroom activity about pairs or small group work in the classroom, um, certainly to the extent that we can maintain at least a little bit of spacing uh, between the students uh, and the faculty and students would be preferable, uh, at least three feet. Um, so again, we're not precluding small group work, but uh, again, I think we're possible if we can maximize the spacing, uh, that's obviously preferable. Uh, Carlo, there's a question about uh, where they, uh, someone might, uh, if a student self-reports that they've tested positive, uh, is that they should contact the PCR team, is that right? So there's a self-reporting form on the website, um, which uh, gives you sort of several choices as to why you're contacting. It can say, you know, I've tested positive, I have symptoms, uh, I'm a close contact. Uh, there's several categories uh, of self-reporting. Um, so if they become aware, they could just encourage the student um, to self-report uh, if they haven't already. But again, we'll will be aware of any positive case that's done through our testing center. So this is generally if they've tested positive somewhere else. Um, there's a question about the green screen, Carlo, and how the green screen works. So the green screen right now, you'll see a change if you uh, haven't been on campus for a while, a change to the daily screener. We've kept the name daily screener, but now what happens is someone uh, logs on with their NYU credentials, their NetID and password, uh, and it will check either for uh, that you are fully vaccinated, means, meaning you are two weeks out from your last dose uh, of your series, or you have an exemption, an approved exemption, uh, are partially compliant and have had a negative result within the last, uh, a negative test result within the last week. That will then give you a green screen 
uh, which will provide your building access. Oh, there's a question about, about field trips. Um, would it be worthwhile uh, maybe just to mention the events uh, guidelines, Carlo? Yeah, so we are allowing field trips, particularly day trips um, within the context of the meeting, gathering uh, and event guidance, uh, which means that they're small uh, and you know, there's no food and you know, indoors versus outdoors. There's several parameters laid out, which is on the website. Um, individual event hosts uh, can at their discretion have the uh, event. Uh, if it doesn't meet all the criteria, then there is a process to ask for an event exemption. Uh, and um, we've been looking at those and generally granting most uh, with some tweaks to the organization of the event. And again, it's just to risk mitigate uh, as much as possible. Uh, Clay, there's a question about uh, instructions for setting up Brightspace. Where should faculty go? Clay? I'm sorry, I was muted. I was just saying, let me just paste the URL in the chat. Um, but uh, yeah, so it's, it's as you would expect, brightspace.nyu.edu, but I'll just put it here so everyone's got it. Um, where is the... um, and uh, if you are setting this up for the first time, it may take a couple of hours for your class list to populate. So if you set up your course shell and you don't see your students yet, just wait. The registrar system does not update in real time, uh, but the rest of the materials are there. Um, and then you should, you, you know, as I pasted earlier in the chat, you should be able to talk to ed tech support in your, uh, uh, in your school if you have questions about that. Um, and there's a, there's a good set of, of uh, sort of training and walkthrough materials as well that they can, that they can direct you to. There's a question about uh, religious exemptions and there is a, a process to uh, request either religious or medical exemptions to the vaccine mandate. Uh, Monique, is there a link? It's on the uh, NYU Returns uh, pages, but we will uh, try to get a link up uh, into the chat. I think we're coming to the end of our time. I hope we've been able to answer uh, at least some of your, of your questions. Uh, again, we are so grateful for all the work you're doing. Uh, for NYU, for the way you are uh, really giving our, our students what, what they need and want, and uh, for, for uh, doing it with, with always such uh, uh, intelligence and integrity as well. So thank you so much. And please don't uh, hesitate to reach out uh, to any of us uh, if there are further questions, uh, as well as, of course, to the leadership of your respective schools. So thank you all so much. And thank you so much to the uh, tech support team on this uh, webinar for uh, pulling it all together. Uh, Carlo, Clay, or Chris, any, any last words? Thank you everyone <clears throat> for attending.